This is an excellent conference, and I've been to many conferences on genocide. It is one in which I am learning a great deal, and I am feeling a great deal, as I'm sure all of us are, and I appreciate that very much. One of the things I frankly resent is when genocide study becomes a dry bones kind of assembly of informations and data and history and disputes about definitions and one forgets completely the utter tragedy, the utter immorality, the horror of what we're talking about and our need always to remember and to care, and on that basis to go forward. And I want to make another remark. I appreciate this conference very, very much, because from the very beginning of the invitation that I received, and in everything that I am hearing here, including the wonderful statement of the Prime Minister of Greece, there is a combination of emphases. First, this is a memorial. It is the 100th anniversary of the Greek genocide, a critical point of remembrance for everybody. And at the same time, the emphasis has been and is that this is a conference that is intended to look for and I think activate steps towards contributing to the reduction of genocide for all peoples everywhere in the world because that is the ultimate moral meaning of the genocide of every one of our peoples. We now know what human beings do and we've got to do something about it. And I'll make a last remark I've enjoyed in a particular way the, you call them the volunteers for this conference. Uh, the energy, the commitment, and the amazing professionalism of these unemployed volunteers has been very striking for me and is a sign for me of the potential of the Greek community for moving forward towards greater recognition of the Greek genocide, which is, I'm sorry to join many of you who have remarked, the recognition is far behind what it should be. The Greek community has been slow in mobilizing and challenging the world to know what happened here and I'm happy to feel this energy of moving forward to correct that and the energy of these young organizers that very much is committed to doing something about genocide in the world. So thank you for a superb conference. Now, on this occasion of the 100th anniversary, and in the context of very great Greek traditions of the development of wisdom and philosophy, and the magnificent contribution of Greek culture to the development of the concept of democracy, I am having the chutzpah. Do you know that word? It's a Hebrew word that is also in Yiddish. It's a, a kind of um, courage that, 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 that provokes. It provokes a degree of discomfort because it calls on people to respond to something that is not simple and not politically easy. I am calling and inviting the community of Greek genocide scholars and activists 
to lead the world in what I call a worldwide campaign for life, respect, protect life. The motto, the logo is respect, protect life. Every life is sacred, every human being is endowed with an inalienable dignity. Pope Francis addressing a joint session of the US Congress. All people are one to the Buddha, and the Buddha is an all, wrote a Swiss Indian author. In every culture we will find, in millions of human beings we will find that people arrive inwardly at the knowledge of this truth, that all human life is sacred, and that that is what we need to be committed to. As many of you know, I am, even in my old age, still a practicing psychologist, psychotherapist, and the way I look at therapy is that to be emotionally healthy, one needs, I'll put it in the negative and then the positive, one needs not to be doing harm to one's life, and one needs not to be doing harm to other people's lives. And to state it positively, the way to be mentally healthy is to be damn good to yourself and damn good to others and make life good and healthy and fun without damage. But now I want to add that the truth of genocide, the truth of understanding of genocide, is deeply embedded in the human being. It is a species problem, in my judgment. It is a universal problem, the facts tell us. It's in all of our peoples. If not actually, in a few cases, not that many. But the potential is there in all of our peoples, in all of our nations, in all of our religions, it is there, sadly, tragically, even in peoples who have been victims and of whom we expect a far greater sensitivity to the sacredness of human life. I believe that the issue derives from a neglected awareness in psychology to this day, psychologists do a lot to help people feel good, which is great. But they do so very often at the expense of recognizing the complexity of what is going on in the people. I believe that we are all born to begin with, with two sets of instincts. Both are natural. Both were given to us by the computer company that gives us our first programs. The one set of instincts is to protect life, beginning with our own and extending to others. And there's a scale of development. We begin to feel for others based on our intimate family relationships, our linkages, and if we grow as human beings, we extend it more and more to all fellow human beings. And we heard some beautiful and touching things along those lines during these days, today I think especially. But we have another set of instincts. And that set of instincts, in my judgment, is one of using anger, and using violence, beginning at the very least in self-defense, because we animals are indeed at risk. There are so many dangers. Life and history tell us that overwhelmingly. 
and you need to be ready to defend yourself. That's an aspect of life. But it continues beyond that to a quest for power and a quest for superiority, which are built in to a great extent in the human psyche. So here we are thrust into the world with two pieces of machinery. They sound as if they are in great contradiction to one another. And indeed, in my judgment, they create a basic dialectical process. Dialectical, the antagonism of contradictory forces. And the handling of dialectics, in my judgment, is what leads to the outcomes. One can shape the response to both sets of instincts to emerge as strong people using the power that comes from the capacity for anger and self-defense, but directed and devoted to the basic purpose of advancing life for ourselves and for others. Let me tell you that as a therapist, I'll do this on the individual level as an illustration. I have treated any number of cases of serious violence in the making. And I have taken away knives, literally, from any number, generally teenagers. I took a gun away from one adult. I handled at least two men who were threatening to kill me in my office. And the way in which I do it is I make a statement. I don't speak quietly. I don't speak quotes professionally. I'm there with them and I say to them, I know you're very angry. I'm going to help you with your anger, but you know that it's wrong to do harm to human beings. If I only said, you know it's wrong to do harm to human beings, I am confident that the person would not stop in their violent behavior. If I only said, I'm going to help you with your anger, I believe that in the majority of cases, the person would not stop with their violent behavior. When I say both, I'm the old apothecary, do you know that word, the pharmacist? Mixing the two ingredients in a cup and that's the medicine. And so far, I'm here to tell you about it because I've never been injured. Because it works. In a, enough cases in my life that I truly believe in. And I apply that kind of thinking when I look for solutions on the larger levels of our dealing with the potential for violence as well. The purpose of the worldwide campaign for life, respect, protect life, is to lead to an epical change of the basic human consciousness. There is no question, as I've been saying in my opinion, that killing is a basic instinctual drive. I hate it, but that's the way I see it. Along with a basic instinct for protecting life. And that throughout every individual's existence and throughout every collective historical process of our nations, our religions, our organizations, there are repeated choices to be made between both of these natural drives. The project I'm going to propose is to implant in human consciousness and experiencing everywhere in a wide range of human cultures, not just in our whatever Western culture, a creative resolution of the dialectic of the drives to life and, life and death in distinct favor of respect and protection of human life. And I hope to spell it out in a few minutes much more. But first, let me emphasize that what I'm proposing is not a 
simple solution, not a brief solution. It's a many years worldwide project. I propose that it take place in the many languages of human life in our world. I propose that the project is to involve the beloved and honored leaders of all walks of life, that they should be at the center of the project, but not only they, beginning in particular with the mutual embraces of traditionally rival religious ethnic leaders, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment, but joining them, the heroes of all sorts of aspects of our lives, our sports heroes. I hope Messi and Rolando are available. Our medical heroes, the person who just created the solution to a terrible medical problem, our leaders of science and industry from all cultures, artists, singers, scientists, communication specialists, political leaders, cultural heroes, and more and more. And I'll try to describe what I mean about using them in this project. The project, as I said, is to take place all around the world in many different venues, and it should be in the languages of many different ethnicities. It will include a full panorama of presentations and statements by leaders, panel discussions, news bulletins, video documentaries, dramatic films, series, the kinds of things that at the end of a hard day so many of us sit down to watch a TV series in order to enjoy some entertainment. The intention of the project is to infuse the world with the theme Respect, protect life. It needs to include a recognizable logo that will be developed in the course of the project, like Coca-Cola or McDonald's, but something that speaks of life. It certainly needs to have music, a musical theme that becomes one that everybody recognizes as the theme of the Respect, Protect Life project. As I said, the religious leaders of many different faiths are to play a key role in inspiring and legitimating this effort. Why? Because they have an archetypal power, an influence that is waiting embedded in the little boy and little girl in a great many of us, the majority of us from our childhood experiences, where we, we were introduced to the images of gods and religions and the precept thou shalt not kill. And it's a beautiful concept. And there's a part of us that will never give up a kind of reverence for the almightiness of it all. And I want to employ that through the use of the religious leaders. Unfortunately, the institution of religion on its own, again, the apothecary is speaking, doesn't do the trick. The concept thou shalt not kill is still around as a critical commandment, but I fear it is violated as often as all the lectures in this Congress <laughs> attest with the statistics and information that we have, let alone domestic violence, let alone the murders that take place in many a city in the course of a normal week. So to sum up the introduction, my goal is a project that may contribute to a new universal abhorrence with the concept 
and the action of taking the lives of unarmed, defenseless people. Our goal is to impact on and change the basic default in the basic operating system of our human brains. I enjoyed Carl Wilkins' remarks about the neural pathways that are activated in our brains. Today, our brains know that violence is always to be expected. And when the news reports come in of a new genocide, we all say, oh my God, but I don't believe a single one of us is shocked anymore because we know that is the default in the human mind. And I believe that genocide prevention calls on us to get to work on changing that default. Now, I'll take a moment of pleasure to share with you. This is not the first time I've spoken in Greece. And in 2005, I was at the Armenian Genocide Memorial in Yerevan when the director, preceding you, Haruta, <laughs> before Haig, asked me to go up to the plaza because at the Yerevan Memorial for the Armenian Genocide, which to my mind has been split off too much from the co-victims, although there's an improvement taking place, and I think Dr. Theriot was talking about it, they were holding a Memorial Day. The place was full of Greek flags and Greek priests and the Greek community, and it was my pleasure on behalf of the Armenian Genocide Memorial and on behalf of the International Association of Genocide Scholars to go and greet the group. Here in Greece, I've been to two previous conferences. We don't have time to talk about it right now, but one of the proposals I brought to you and that has and that picked up a certain kind of momentum was the thought of creating an organization called R2L, Right to Life, which would be based initially on the membership of members of many different peoples who have suffered genocide joining together. Jews, Armenians, Greeks, Cambodians, Sudanese, joining together in the universality of a single organization. It doesn't contradict each of our people continuing our memorials. Of course we do. It's like family. We have our own individual occasions. But it expands us to a broader concept of the entire world of the human race. <coughs> Okay, let me talk about the project. What I want to emphasize is that I'm not speaking about a one-time event, a one-time conference, a one-time pageant, a one-time telethon. I wonder how many of you know that there have been a good number of instances where there have been one, two, three-day meetings of religious leaders of different faiths which have ended up with imams and rabbis and priests and ministers and so forth of the different religions. They come in at first and they look at each other with that kind of, well, when I was a little boy, I'm ashamed to tell you, but that's the way it was. My father, my Jewish father, who was a rabbi, told me that I was not to look at the face of a church when we walked past it. And I did look. Shh. <laughs> they ended up dancing together. They ended up hugging one another. They ended up issuing manifestos together. It's an absolute joy to read the record 
and I have the records of at least six such conferences over the years. They continue to take place. How many of you knew of such conferences? I see one hand, <laughs> and that was my point. We don't know because they have failed to have any impact going beyond the desirable impact of their touching these leaders for their own leadership work in their communities. The purpose of this project that I'm proposing is one that it becomes a long-term continuous event and approach in human society. It's to be a thought and feeling changing process in the minds and hearts of many, it won't be all, people around the world. What about the heroes? So the religious leaders, the stars of song, of music and dance, theater scientists, computer leaders, business leaders, medical leaders, etc., as I've been referring to them. What happens when they appear? Well, if they appear regularly, and we have our best programmers in the world who create concepts and models for the ways in which they appear together on TV and don't just stand there as wooden Indians, they speak to each other, they touch each other, they share concepts with each other, they support one another in things that they have to tell about a new hospital and a new way of helping children and a new way of stopping domestic violence. And such programs are repeated, and I count on the professionals in entertainment, in TV, in theater, to create the programs. We don't have to know how to do it. And if this becomes a regular and repeated motif, short little appearances, broader appearances, I don't know whether you have in Greece now spot announcements about how to be more careful as a driver. That's the way you approach the terrible problem of people being wild in their driving and the terrible accident rates that we have in many places. The purpose is to create a new model that slowly but surely enters into the inner consciousness of human beings. Just picture for a moment blacks and whites joining together in appearances. Are you a Accustomed to that, we are more than we used to be. How about a Pakistani and an Indian? How about having a Chinese person and a Uyghur? How about a Myanmar Buddhist and a Rohingya? How about a Sri Lankan Sinhalese and a Tamil? How about dancers from Scotland, Zambia, the United Kingdom, and Cambodia? How about people who bake bread, the morning breads in Chile, Canada, Nigeria, and Japan? I had a wonderful sociology teacher in college who devoted many of the classes not to lectures but to experiences and we were a multinational group of students at an American university. And I remember the one that she devoted to are coming in with stories of how bread was made and served, and in many cases blessed, in the various cultures that were represented in the class. And a bunch of unruly stu American students who go to classes because you have to go to class, but you gotta get the information and you have to get the grade. And we were absolutely charmed and began to feel one another as fellow human beings and to have a pleasure 
Sorry, I violated the rules. <laughs> and to have a pleasure with the awareness of one another as coming from and representing different cultures. The story of influencing a public is a terribly important one for all of us. It turns out that authoritarian countries, in many cases, do a heck of a good job on inserting into the consciousness of their populations the horrible poisonous ideas that make it possible for their populations to go ahead and commit all the terrible destructive acts that there are. Okay. Yes, yeah, it will be. Uh, for example, a New York Times review recently of Chinese propaganda in the digital age describes how China has learned how to compete with short videos. Think of what I've been saying about promoting life and listen to the devices China uses not for promoting life. Short videos, Hollywood movies, mobile games for the public's attention span. The com I'm quoting from the New York Times. The Communist Party has also learned to lean on most popular artists and the most experienced internet companies to help it instill China, Chinese with patriotic uh, zeal. Um, other examples. Here's another story. This one is from Haaretz. Russia's long election reach, Kremlin operatives spread cash and disinformation to sway the vote in Madagascar. Translate that in terms of the theme I'm trying to promote where we have media that are devoted to swaying the soul towards respect for human life and our responsibility and privilege to protect human life. Here's another one from Haaretz that happens to be the, we read on a daily basis, both the Hebrew and the English editions of Haaretz. In India, religious hate is served via pop songs Remember what I began to say about the use of music. Hindu singers openly call for violence against Muslims and minorities. How about having lots of good music that calls for the sacredness of human life? Now, in the time that I've got left, I want to speak about two other aspects of such a project which, as I said, I propose to Greece to be a leader in, for the world. First of all, a project like this needs a terrific leadership. And I regret that I am totally aware that I'm too old to even try to be an initiator of such a project. I've initiated a lot of stuff in my life I was one of the key founders of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. Uh, I, I've, I've created a number of projects over the years. It's time for, this is a call to a young person, a young person in their 30s, a young person in their 40s, who has that kind of love and care and initiative and power, and we all know that some of us have that ability for leadership, and others of us have less of that. It needs a professional organization, or a government, or a combination thereof, that will appoint a proper leader, who will in turn develop a proper staff that will spend a few years trying to build the base for such a project. It's not easy, but my point today is to suggest that it really is doable. But it needs money, doesn't it? Well, amazing things happen in this world. 
magnificent buildings like this are created. There are companies that devote enormous money to life-saving projects. And we have mega companies now in our world. I would expect our leadership to start contacting and asking for grants, perhaps creating a consortium. I don't know whether Google will be interested or Twitter will be interested or Facebook will or Microsoft will or Amazon will or Walmart will. I propose that such a leadership turn to the United Nations, that it turn to the international church organizations, the ecumenical organizations, that it turn to international health organizations. The possibility is there, that's all I wanna say. I mean, once upon a time when I had to raise money for some organization, <laughs> it scared the heck out of me. Uh, but I learned how to do it, to keep a few organizations going. L many of you have done that. There are skills available, and there really are very wealthy resources out there, some of which want to devote some of their wealth to making an impact to keep people alive. And that's what we're talking about. It would be wonderful to have such a consortium of several resources that in itself would represent a coming together of several cultures. Many years ago, I created the first international newsletter about genocide studies. We called it, this was before the internet began, and believe it or not, we called it Internet for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. We published it in our offices in Jerusalem, distributed it throughout the world to professionals. It was the first communication organ that addressed people in the different professions Psychologists would read psychology stuff, anthropology, anthropologists would read anthropology publications. We created an interdisciplinary platform. Well, what is important that is relevant to what I'm speaking about is I would not launch that internet until we have the sponsorship of at least four different ethnicities joining together so that the message of our platform to begin with was we are all human beings together. We are not only devoted to the memory of the particular genocide that is indeed closest to our heart. Let me tell you a story. Uh, after Lemkin's book, in which he created the word genocide in 1944, there was no book in English in the United States on genocide, 1944, until about 1978, when a man named Irving Lewis Hurwitz, a sociologist, published a book, Genocide and State Power, followed by Leo Cooper in 1981, who, about whom we have heard, a man whom I loved very much, and to me was the great leader of genocide studies, and then my first book in 1982, How Can We Commit the Unthinkable? And the three of us were identified by amnesty as the emerging leaders of an effort to study this phenomenon called genocide. And the leader of Amnesty, which at that point had just received its Nobel Prize, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember that there's an earlier period where Amnesty is growing and doing beautiful things, but it is held in deep suspicion as who knows what they really want. 
the three of us were invited by Amnesty to present to Amnesty the concern with genocide and our proposal that Amnesty take on genocide along with its concern for prisoners of conscience. We went to Amsterdam, the three of us. We presented, we failed. The board of directors of Amnesty turned it down. However, the leader of Amnesty, the man who had led it from its beginnings to a Nobel Prize status, was a man named Martin Ennels. Martin Ennels refused to go along with the idea being turned down. And he then did the unheard of thing professionally. He resigned from amnesty and he accepted a new position with an organization that didn't exist that Leo Cooper then set up with the name International Alert. Its purpose was to be an anti-genocide organization in the world. And Ennels became the Secretary General. They had nothing for starters. I visited Ennels at the new office in London, and I had to fight hard, and I was thinner then. I had to fight hard to get into the one chair that was left uh, alongside of the desk in this room. Unfortunately, Martin Ennels passed away in a relatively short time and the organization never took off. But what I am referring to now is, I hope that there will be a Martin Ennels personality, a young leader, a young professional who will be inspired to undertake this kind of a role. I'm gonna conclude with a couple of quotes. You know who Eric Frum was? Many of you do, I assume. He's a great intellectual hero of mine and the point of this quotation is right in the first sentence. If you begin your resistance to a Hitler only after he has won his victory, then you've lost before you've even begun. And the next quote I want to reach for is one that I appreciate so much that I've used it over and over again. It's Albert Camus at the end of World War II. And he says to all of us, the years have killed something in us. And that something is simply the old confidence man had in himself, which led him to believe that he could always elicit human reactions from another man if he spoke to him in the language of a common humanity. No way. We have seen men lie, degrade, kill, deport, torture, and each time it was not possible to persuade them not to do so. Before anything can be done, two questions must be put. Do you or do you not directly or indirectly want to kill or assault? And Camus concludes, for my part, I am fairly sure that I have made the choice. And having chosen, I think that I must speak out, that I must state that I will never again be one of those, whoever they be, who compromise with murder. That's the project that I am proposing to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tarney, for that um, very, very moving uh, presentation. Um, I think you really um, helped um, breed um, inspiration and um, optimism in a time where there's, there's very little optimism. Um, why don't we open up for questions? Um, we're running on a uh, strict uh, uh, time schedule, so I would appreciate if we could just keep the, the questions to questions and not um, statements. This gentleman? What? 
Uh, uh, you choose the question. I, whatever you say. I, I don't know what I wish. Do you want me to sit over here? Okay. I need this. Ο κύριος Ισραήλ Τσάρνη έχει θίξει βαθιά φιλοσοφικά οντολογικά προβλήματα. Ο διαχρονικός δάσκαλος του Θουκυρίδης είχε πει ότι ο άνθρωπος ρέπει προς την κακία και μάλιστα το γνωστό που είχε πει, έχει γράψει, ότι ο, ο ισχυρός επιβάλλει ό,τι του επιτρέπει η δύναμή του και ο αδύναμος υποχωρεί όσο του επιτρέπει η αδυναμία του. Και μάλιστα τόνισε ότι και οι θεοί υποτάσσονται σε αυτή τη νομοτέλεια όπως την είχε χαρακτηρίσει. Επίσης ένας Έλληνας μεγάλος στοχαστής, ο Παναγιώτης Κονδύλης, είχε πει είχε μιλήσει για την ετερογωνία των σκοπών που σημαίνει ότι οι εκατομμύρια άνθρωποι αγωνίστηκαν για την ουτοπία όπως για το εφικτό που έθιξε ο, ο, ο μιλητής αλλά στην πράξη ε, προέκυψαν αντίθετα αποτελέσματα από τα προσωπόμενα. Το ερώτημα είναι έχει ο άνθρωπος την, η, την ικανότητα της ε, επιλογής, δηλαδή την ελευθερία να αλλάξει αυτές τις καταστάσεις. Ευχαριστώ. My answer on the individual level is in many cases yes. For example, I once treated a high school boy the school had referred him telling me that he was weird was unable to read and that he was going to drop out of school. But they were most concerned with his weirdness. When I met the boy, I learned from him that he was planning a good old, forgive me for the, the sarcasm in this, a good old American mass murder at the shopping center. I think one of the terrible contributions of American culture to this world has been that mode of mass killing. And he was well along in his plan. He had the scripts in his head. He knew who the police chief was of the squad that would come to intervene. He was planning to hit the climax by killing the police chief and to be killed by him. I worked with him on his choice, which is... To the mic. I worked with him on his choice, which is what you're talking about. And one of his first responses was, you know, you have to be careful. I said, why? He said, you're too good. You're going to get hurt in this world. I continued to work with him. He made his choice. He never did a mass murder. And this boy who could never read gave me a gift at the end of the therapy. He brought me a magnificent book at the level of our reading about the Nazi SS and the ways in which that group operated. He knew how to read. And he chose a book that was appropriate for me. Can change be effected on a collective level? Yes. Again, beginning with something simple. There were experiments, social psychological experiments, which show that if a bigot stands up in a crowd and makes an anti-black statement, an anti-whatever ethnicity statement, and nobody answers the bigot, that the people in the crowd who hear this, the, when they are then interviewed and examined, in the research, they shift towards becoming more and more prejudiced. But if one person stands up and says, 
that's wrong to say, that's un-American, that's indecent, that's not Jewish, that's not the way we Greeks operate. There is a shift towards greater respect for other ethnicities on the part of many people in the group. Yes, I believe there, are, there is room for major work on the choices that collective groups of people make. It's not a perfect process, it's not an absolute process, but it can create huge shifts if applied systematically, and that's what the project is about. Thank you. Um, I think this woman had a question, and then we can go to the gentleman here. Λέγομαι Μαργαρίτα Νικολαίδου και είμαι ψυχαναλήτρια. Άκουσα με πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον και προσοχή την ομιλία σας και την πρότασή σας, η οποία εύχομαι να απλωθεί και πέρα από εδώ για να μπορέσει να υλοποιηθεί. Μιλήσατε για μια μετατόπιση τώρα μόλις. Και θα έλεγα ότι σε σχέση με αυτά που μας φέρατε θα χρειαστεί να σκεφτεί ο καθένας καταρχάς που είναι εδώ από μας το ότι μέσα μας οι επιλογές είναι δύο όπως είπατε εξ αρχής της ζωής και του θανάτου της προστασίας και της καταστροφής Τι είναι αυτό που κάνει την ενδόμηχη επιλογή από τη στιγμή που γεννιέται κανείς και μετά, υποκειμενική, αλλά και πόσο συμβάλλει σε αυτό η οικογένεια, η κοινωνία και ο πολιτισμός. Είναι τελείως διαφορετικό αυτό που είπατε από αυτό που ακούστηκε από τον κύριο και είναι πολύ σημαντικό αυτό που είπε όμω ο κύριος ότι το καλό και το κακό είναι ανταγωνιστές και ο ισχυρός υπερισχύει. Ποιος είναι ο ισχυρός? Είναι ένα ερώτημα που έθεσα στον εαυτό μου πολύ νωρίς. Γιατί έχουμε την αίσθηση ότι το κακό... Συγγνώμη, είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό, γιατί αν θέλουμε να τοποθετηθούμε σε σχέση με την γνώση... Οκ, οκ. Τελειώνω. Το ερώτημα λοιπόν είναι θέσατε... You, you uh, speak about the true and the knowledge. Ναι, απευθυνθήκατε στον ασθενή σας, όχι λέγοντάς το ότι κάνει λάθος, αλλά απευθυνθήκατε σε αυτόν σε σχέση με ότι κάτι ξέρει. What's the question? The question is that he talked, he talked about the question of the truth at the beginning of his speech. Okay? And the question of the truth is a big question... What's your question? For the history, for the politics, for everyone. And also, he put another concept, which is the knowledge. Okay. What, what's your, can you just... No, I want to ask him about this. Okay, ask the question then, because we're, okay. we're running low on time. Το ερώτημα είναι ότι για να μπορέσουν να γίνουν αλλαγές και μετατροπές, δεν θα πρέπει να δουλέψουμε σε σχέση με την αλήθεια και τη γνώση. Με συγχωρείτε, αλλά μου αναγκάζεται να το κάνω πολύ σύντομο. Γιατί η γνώση έχει να κάνει με αυτό το οποίο ο καθένας γνωρίζει για τον εαυτό του σε σχέση με το μίσος και την αγάπη. Ευχαριστώ. Yeah, no, I, I think I follow the drift of the question. For me, the educational solution lies not in saying choose only good and put aside all bad and evil. There isn't a person here who doesn't have, quotes, bad thoughts, bad feelings, bad impulses. They are natural, they are parts of us as human beings. But now comes the choice how to recognize them understand the feeling that is in them, but then devote the energy of the bad to serving the good. Dialectics is a process where two opposing forces contradict one another, but work out an integration that is constructive and not destructive. 
I think, for example, it's the secret to good marriage relationships. Not where people are 100% nice to each other all the time. It doesn't work. It's where people know how to use the two parts of themselves, but always committed to decency and friendship and cooperation. And I think that can be taught on a collective level. Um, thank you, Dr. Charnu. I'm, I'm sorry, but we have to end the question round because we have a speaker in the United States who's been uh, holding on uh, Skype, uh, Professor Toten. So if you have questions for Dr. Charney, please address them to him after the, the uh, panel right now. Um, let's give Dr. Charney a, a round of applause for his contribution.